Yes, hello everyone. Um, welcome to Garth Day. Um, essentially, uh, after this nice overview uh, from Garth, I will just go a bit more in detail uh, and talk about the buildup of UV luminosity functions and, and the stellar math growth uh, from uh, within cosmic ionization down to redshift of about uh, four. Uh, and of course, my Collaborators here are also from the UDF09 team, including Garth and Richard, that we'll talk just later. But I also want to point out, in particular, Valentino Gonzalez and Ivo Labe, uh, who cannot be here today, but who did a lot of work on, on IRAC, and, and I will show some of their results uh, as well. And so, just to recap again, um, as Garth was pointing out, essentially to push into the reionization uh, epoch, we really need um, near infrared data to detect galaxies because uh, they're just completely invisible uh, at optical wavelengths at redshift above seven. And so we need deep near infrared imaging that we, of course we have uh, in the Trinity field south now, but also we need deep optical imaging uh, to establish uh, these breaks and to make sure that these galaxies are indeed at high redshift. Uh, and so Really, the data set that I'm going to be using today is all uh, concentrated in the channel deep field south, where we have the deepest optical and uh, near infrared image over the Hubble ultra deep field. And then we have these deep parallel fields, and we also have a wider area component uh, from candles and, and ERS. So we have a total of about 160 uh, square arc minutes where we can go to look for galaxies down to 27, uh, between 27 and 29.4 uh, AB magnitudes. And so just to, to give you a flavor of how these galaxies look like, uh, as you can see here, uh, we're looking for, for Redshift 7 sources, uh, well-detected sources uh, in all the near-infrared bands, blue uh, colors, and then starting, they start to disappear in the side band and are completely invisible, uh, a short word of that. Okay, so let's uh, not waste any time here. Let's look directly at the buildup uh, of the galaxy population based on the UV luminosity function. And... Uh, this is our current result uh, at Redshift 7. Um, as you can see here, the red dots is from, these are the, the results from the UDF-09 and the RS uh, program. Um, and essentially you can see that we, we probe the faint end uh, very well uh, with HST. Uh, we find slopes that are extremely steep, uh, as Garth was pointing out. Uh, but what I also want to point out here is that there's this, this huge amount of, of data points here at the bright end. And these are all ground-based constraints from uh, Subaru, uh, so prime cam with red sensitive uh, CCDs, and also VLT Hawkeye with, with near-infrared detectors. Uh, and so uh, these data sets are really uh, uh, crucial, essentially, uh, in characterizing the characteristic, uh, 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 the cutoff luminosity at Redshift 7. And if you include these, you, uh, remove, uh, you reduce the uncertainties, uh, in particular on M star, uh, significantly at Redshift 7. <coughs> So the problem is, as we move to Redshift 8, uh, ground-based observations, at least currently, uh, the, the constraints are, are not very good. Um, it's just really hard uh, to, to probe in the near-infrared from the ground. And so we only have upper limits at very bright magnitudes. And so even after including all uh, the candles, uh, good south data, essentially the uncertainties on the faint end slope and, and on a, in particular on the characteristic luminosity at Redshift 8 are still uh, quite significant. Um, but of course, uh, there's more data out there. There's, uh, for instance, pure parallel data that we will be uh, including in this. There's upcoming candles, goods north data, uh, clash, and also uh, there's new uh, data over the UDF. So, so there will be, uh, uh, this will be uh, reduced, uh, these errors will be reduced in the near future. But what is clear already is that there's this, this very uh, uniform uh, uh, evolution from, of the luminosity function as you go from redshift 4, 6 to 8, uh, there's a clear dimming as you go to higher redshift. And um, as Garth was pointing out, we can actually push this even a little bit further uh, out to redshift 10. Uh, with HST, we have this capability based on uh, H-band detections. Essentially, uh, at redshift 9, uh, the Lyman alpha break shifts into the J-band, and so we can select these galaxies based on very red J minus H colors and, and being undetected a uh, short word of that. And uh, one, this, of course, is very challenging. These galaxies will be only detected in the H band. We don't have any measurement uh, long word uh, of the break so to establish uh, you know, a, a blue uh, UV continuum. And so uh, Spitzer IRAC has really proven to be extremely useful uh, to do this, uh, to remove in, uh, Redshift 2 dusty red galaxies. Um, in particular, we did a, a a systematic search over the channel deep field south 
we identified 17 sources uh, that satisfy our HSD selection criteria, um, but 16 out of these, uh, uh, you can see here, they're just booming in IRAC. So there's, these are intermediate redshift, dusty, star-forming galaxies, and there's no way, of course, that these are uh, at redshift 10. And so there's only one candidate that Garth was pointing out that we have. There's one source at redshift 10 um, that we identified over the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's very faint, essentially 29th magnitude. It's only detected here in the H-band. And um, we did a whole suite of tests to really ensure and, and to convince ourselves that this source is real. Um, uh, it's detected, for instance, in different subsplits of the data. Richard Ellis will add one other epoch here, so there will be more. Uh, more constraints here. And also, uh, we made sure that this source is really at high redshift. Uh, it has a very small chance of being a, a low redshift contaminant, and the current photometric redshift is, is 10.4. And so, of course, uh, given that we have only one source, we cannot put any serious measure, we cannot make any serious measurements uh, of the redshift 10 luminosity function, but we can get already quite good constraints here. Um, in particular, so these are our upper limits at redshift 10. In particular, uh, the three wide fields. Uh, uh, from those, it's clear that uh, there is clear evolution from redshift 8 uh, to redshift 10. And from our deeper uh, fields, essentially we see that if you extrapolate the trends that we saw from redshift 4 to redshift 8 out to redshift 10, that's the luminosity function that you would have expected. And our, wide field, uh, our three deep fields essentially are, the upper limits are essentially a factor of about 5 or so even below that. So there seems to be accelerated evolution going on. Uh, from redshift 8, from redshift 10 up to redshift 8, in only 170 million years we have a buildup of more than an order of magnitude and then uh, continuously a, a, a smooth evolution after that from redshift 8 to redshift 4. But of course uh, this uh, is, is still uncertain, uh, one source only at the moment, and, but, but to make, make further progress we really need a dedicated HSD program or then of course uh, JWST will just do this uh, like for, for breakfast essentially. Um, and so you see this clear, uh, nice uh, evolution of the luminosity function. If you look at the Schachter function parameters here, uh, we have a five star denormalization, characteristic luminosity, M star, and the faint end slope. And it's clear that um, the main evolution here is really in M star in the, in the characteristic luminosity. Galaxies get brighter by about uh, 30 to 40 percent per unit redshift here. Um, and again, the faint end slope is very steep, minus 1.7 at redshift 4, and, and getting uh, somewhat steeper. There's tentative evidence now that this gets somewhat steeper out to higher redshift, uh, and Richard will talk about this uh, later on. And then, of course, uh, we, look at the, we can look at the luminosity density evolution uh, above our completeness limit, and uh, if we uh, include some dust correction that Richard will tell us about, we see that essentially from redshift 8 up to redshift 4, uh, there's a one order of magnitude growth in the cosmic star formation rate density and then another uh, little factor of three uh, also uh, up to uh, the peak at redshift two to three. <coughs> okay, so now that we know everything about the star formation rates, uh, let's look at bulk masses. Um, uh, essentially, we really need, of course, a Spitzer to do this. Um, as you can see here, uh, with, with HST, we can only probe the rest frame UV and, and Spitzer is the only way currently uh, to measure rest frame optical light uh, at, of, for any galaxy at redshift above uh, four. And so, uh, and if you don't have these rest frame optical constraints, essentially the uncertainties in the stellar mass estimates that you have uh, are just huge, more than an order of magnitude. Um, but one of the challenges here is the broad PSF, really, of Spitzer. It's essentially 10 times larger uh, than with three. And so, uh, what, we re what you need to do uh, very carefully here is to really model uh, all the neighboring sources of your uh, candidate that you, that you want to measure photometry of and, um, and essentially clean those, uh, extract from a very uh, clean PSF uh, of Spitzer and then uh, you, get, you can measure the photometry uh, based on that image. And so we do routinely do this now uh, over all these fields. And uh, one of the very nice things of the, of the Channel Deep Field South is there's this additional very deep uh, Spitzer IRAC data. So over the last two years or so, uh, on top of the goods, uh, existing goods data, we now got essentially 126 hours um, over the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and, and sl somewhat uh, shallower over the parallels. But we can use this data now um, 
exactly to push out even to Redshift 8. We now, with this IUDF10 uh, program, essentially this led to the first robust, more than five sigma detections of, of a couple of Redshift uh, 8 candidates, uh, as shown here. Um, but of course, we have this large sample out there, uh, so we can stack SED, we can, we can stack the Spitzer uh, photometry and get stacked SEDs uh, uh, as a function of luminosity uh, of, of Oh, okay, more time, yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, stack, we can get uh, stacked SEDs as a function of luminosity in uh, super, I mean, above L-star galaxies at Redshift 8. Um, and as you can see here, there seems to be uh, quite a significant break, actually, from V3 to IRAC, uh, which is indicative uh, of, uh, of, of older ages, so that these galaxies started to form stars already uh, at Redshift above 12 or so. Uh, but of course, um, uh, a possible caveat here and in the interpretation of ages are uh, nebular emission lines that can uh, contaminate some of these uh, IRAC measurements. <coughs> um, so the next point, that, what the next step that, that what really IRAC uh, told us or taught us is, is really that there's a nice uh, well-defined correlation uh, between uh, stellar masses here uh, and uh, UV luminosities. And so this is uh, uh, measurements from uh, Valentino Gonzalez over the ERS uh, survey only, uh, 300 uh, Redshift 4 candidates, and you can see uh, with stacking uh, you can get, you can get, you can measure this relation over essentially two orders of magnitude in, in stellar mass. And, and using this kind of relation, um, essentially you can get first constraint on the galaxy stellar masses at low masses, uh, down to uh, eight, uh, 10 to the 8 solar masses, even out uh, to Redshift 7. Um, uh, so, uh, and if you integrate this, of course, uh, we can measure the stellar mass densities. Um, and again, uh, from redshift 8 uh, to redshift 4, essentially, exactly in parallel to the star formation rates, essentially the stellar mass density is increasing by one order of magnitude. Uh, and again, this is above the same flux limit that we used for the stellar uh, star formation rate densities. And, and so the question then is, of course, uh, is the buildup in stellar mass uh, compatible with the buildup uh, in star formation rates? Um, and so you can just take the derivative of the stellar mass density evolution uh, and essentially uh, get, uh, you know, measure what, what, what you expect from this buildup. And you see that there is uh, essentially uh, broadly consistent uh, the buildup in stellar masses with uh, star formation rates. <coughs> Okay, so this already leads me to my summary, actually. Um, so, um, yeah, as we saw, uh, V3 really opened up uh, the big uh, window to efficient studies for galaxies in the reionization epoch. We can now detect large samples. We have more than 100 galaxies already um, at redshift 7 and 8, and one even uh, out to redshift uh, 10. Um, we now have uh, uh, large... Uh, with these large samples, we can measure the luminosity function evolution pretty well. Uh, we see that there's a smooth uh, buildup uh, from Redshift 8 uh, to Redshift 4, with initially a, a probably a fast buildup from Redshift 10 uh, to Redshift 8. And um, star formation rates appear to be increasing by one order of magnitude, really, from Redshift 8 to Redshift 4. Um, and uh, the same thing, we find the same increase in, in stellar masses. Star, uh, stellar mass density is increased by a factor 10 from Redshift 8 uh, to Redshift 4, and these seem to be uh, consistent. And with spitz irac essentially, we can push out to Redshift 8. We have first detections now above uh, L-star. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. <coughs> uh, I don't think. Well, I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of models out there that, that predict that. Well, if star formation is triggered by by mergers, for instance, I mean, these are stochastic events that 
yeah, that, that would essentially decouple this. So I think what, what our uh, results point to is that there's sort of a smooth uh, build-up uh, with, with, I don't know, smooth star formation, essentially. Merges are so frequent. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, you you are the modelers. You have to tell us uh, essentially. But I think I mean I think what what yeah our results point to is is a uniform uh, build up, relatively smooth, uh, rather than than a stochastic. Yeah. But of course there is dispersion in these in these relations, and we with Spitzer now, for instance, we can correlate these dispersions. Uh, like the, the dispersion in stellar mass um, and UV luminosity oops, um, with, with colors, for instance, and that would help, of course, to, to, to constrain some of these. So uh, they can be uh, quite significant, unfortunately, um, in particular from, for redshift, from redshift up to redshift 2, uh, we have now direct measurements on, on these. And, and if you extrapolate this, I mean, the, these are the, like, what is this, 0.2 dex or something uh, in stellar masses that you would have, uh, that you would have to correct for. Um, but um, essentially what you can do is you, you have to sample a lot of galaxies individually uh, in, in 3.6 and 4.5, and, and you have to have spectroscopic redshifts for these sources, so you, you know exactly, I mean, because these emission lines are in or out of one of these bands or so. So essentially you can get a population average uh, you know, contribution for, these, for, the, for the spits of fluxes as a function of redshift. And, uh, and I think that's, that's the way forward here. By the way, could people hear the question or should we be repeating them? So how many people could not hear the question? <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll try to repeat the Sorry, question. Yeah. Yeah. The question was about the uh, effects of emission lines on uh, on some of the observations there. Uh, any more questions, Ben? Just for the, the Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs>